Hi folks and welcome back. Uh, in this video we're going to be talking about epistemic injustice and gaslighting. We're going to be drawing on some work from a whole bunch of feminist epistemologists. Uh, in particular we're going to be building on work from Miranda Fricker, Gail Polhouse, Christy Dotson, Patricia Hill Collins, and the papers that we read for this week by uh, Rachel McKinnon. Uh, we're going to use this work to try to come to some understanding of the particular kinds of wrongs that can often be done to someone in their capacity as a knower or in their capacity as uh, an agent within an epistemic practice. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. I want to begin by thinking in very broad terms about what justice is. Now we can uh, we could spend a whole class on this, we could spend a whole semester on this, you could write an entire dissertation on this, and many have been written. But I just want to give uh, a very broad understanding uh, of what the concept of justice is. In the very broadest sense, I think of justice as giving each their due. Uh, it's treating each person with fairness, uh, giving them what is due to them. We can think of this in different realms. In the realm of retributive justice, uh, the realm in which we punish wrongdoers uh, or uh, right wrongs that have been done, we give the wrongdoer what is due to them. Uh, a just punishment is a punishment that is proportionate to the crime that was committed. Uh, in uh, terms of procedural justice, we give each their due uh, in the sense that each person is treated as equal before the law. Uh, no one is favored by the courts. No one is treated differently before the law. Uh, procedural justice requires that everyone is treated the same. Uh, that is treated fairly. Uh, and in the realm that's going to be most important for us, uh, distributive justice is the idea that uh, in a just society, each person uh, is given the resources that they are due or is able to acquire the resources that are due to them. Uh, so uh, justice has to do with giving each person their due. Injustice, then, is a kind of failure to give a person what is due to them, a kind of failure to treat each individual fairly uh, or to give to them what they are deserving of. Um, so we're going to be, uh, in particular, interested in injustices that arise within epistemic practices. What are the ways in which some people are not given what they are due uh, in terms of the epistemic practices in which they are engaged? Um, so let's, let's turn now to epistemic justice more centrally. Uh, we've spent the last, few, uh, well, Previous to last week, we spent a few weeks talking about uh, epistemology, and I introduced you to the idea of an epistemic practice. An epistemic practice is a practice in which knowledge is generated, shared, passed around, and stored in various ways. Uh, and these are social practices, so they are governed by sets of social norms. Uh, there are a variety of norms that we follow uh, as we... Uh, engage in practices of generating knowledge, norms that govern what counts as evidence for what, uh, what claims can be justified by what other sorts of claims. So we've got all sorts of evidential and inferential norms at work within a practice, within an epistemic practice. We can, in some cases, think of epistemic practices as economies. This is a loose analogy, but it's going to be helpful to think in these terms when we turn to questions of epistemic justice. So an economy is, in the broadest sense, just some mechanism for distributing resources. We can have a command economy that does it through central planning. We can have a market economy that uses uh, uses market mechanisms to distribute resources. Uh, and the resources in an economy can be distributed in just or unjust ways. They can be distributed fairly or unfairly. Uh, each person can have what is due to them by virtue of this distribution or can fail to have what is due to them by virtue of this distribution. Um, 
So what are the resources that are distributed in an epistemic practice if we're thinking of it on analogy to an economy? Well, there are a bunch of different kinds of resources that might be distributed within an epistemic practice, but the particular epistemic resources that are going to uh, warrant our attention are resources like credibility, knowledge, and concepts, uh, along with capacities for expertise and understanding. Uh, so let me break this down a little bit. Credibility is a resource within an epistemic economy that everybody wants but not everybody can have. Uh, it is a scarce resource. Uh, some people are rightly treated as more credible than others because they are more reliable at reporting on the things that they have seen. Uh, and they are uh, they are less likely to mislead or tell lies. Uh, and credibility is a valuable resource uh, because if you are someone who is judged by others to be credible, then you have some power within this epistemic practice. You can shape the beliefs of other members of your epistemic community because they're going to take you at your word. They're going to believe what you tell them. And that's a pretty significant power to have. Uh, so uh, credibility is one of these scarce epistemic resources that gets distributed. Knowledge itself is a scarce epistemic resource that gets distributed within knowledge practices. Some people have it, some people don't. Everyone wants access to it because knowledge is power, uh, and uh, not everyone can have access to it. Some knowledge is, is tightly held. Trade secrets, uh, government secrets, uh, are tightly held bits of knowledge that not everyone can have. So they're a scarce resource that's distributed in this economy. And concepts themselves are another scarce resource that is distributed within uh, an epistemic practice. Uh, concepts are uh, the, the sort of shared stores of our understanding. Uh, they're what we use to name things, to express ideas, to communicate ideas to one another, uh, and to understand the world that we inhabit. Uh, and concepts are something that uh, we construct in our society or in our in our social practices. We construct these concepts together and we use them uh, to uh, enhance our understanding and to communicate with one another. But some concepts uh, are uh, considered the purview of a dominant group and non-dominant groups just don't have access to them. Uh, so some concepts are taught uh, only in elite institutions. Some concepts are, uh, are learned and understood uh, only through uh, the family ties that one has or only through the social ties that one has. Uh, and if one lacks those social ties, then one will never uh, gain a uh, facility with those particular concepts. Um, and they won't be able to develop uh, the understanding that comes along with those concepts uh, or uh, become experts in the use of those concepts. Uh, so if we can, if, if someone can control the way in which these concepts are distributed within an epistemic community, uh, there's a great deal of power to be had there as well. Um, so this is what we want to think about. We want to think about epistemic practices as uh, the social practices on analogy with an economy uh, where particular resources are distributed uh, among the uh, uh, among the practitioners. Credibility, knowledge, concepts are distributed among the epistemic practitioners. Um, when things are going well, when it is a just epistemic practice, uh, these uh, these resources are distributed in a just way. That doesn't mean that everyone is treated the same. That doesn't mean, of course, that everyone has access to exactly the same epistemic resources. Uh, some people are going to be treated as credible because they are reliable reporters, and some people are going to be treated as uncredible because they are uh, they are not so reliable. They are uh, they are liable to tell lies or say misleading things. Uh, some people are going to have access to bits of knowledge uh, because of the 
uh, the social position that they hold, and we rightly judge that people in that position ought to have access to this knowledge and others ought not to. Uh, say, for example, doctors with certain uh, medical knowledge, uh, we think they ought to have it and others maybe um, shouldn't have as ready access to it. Uh, so uh, a just distribution of these resources is not an equal distribution, but it's a fair distribution, one in which everyone gets their due. Let's turn then to what an epistemic injustice is. This is a term coined by Miranda Fricker, uh, and uh, she says that an epistemic distribution, or an epistemic injustice is basically an unfair distribution of these epistemic resources. It is a wrong done to someone in their capacity as a knower, a wrong done to someone in their capacity as a participant in one of these epistemic practices. So these resources are not fairly distributed to them. They are suffering from an epistemic injustice in just the way that someone who doesn't uh, receive their fair distribution of the material resources of a society uh, is suffering from uh, a material injustice, an economic injustice within that society, uh, or someone who uh, is not given uh, due process, not provided with due process before the law, is suffering from uh, procedural injustice within their society. We've got the same idea going on here. Uh, and Fricker breaks down uh, epistemic injustices into two types, testimonial injustices and hermeneutical injustices. Let's take each of these in turn. Uh, a testimonial injustice uh, is one that uh, arises in one's capacity as uh, a provider of testimony or provider of evidence for claims. Uh, so let's think again about this credibility economy. Let's focus in actually on this one resource, credibility, uh, and think of the epistemic practice as a kind of credibility economy. We each make credibility judgments about one another. We make judgments about who is a credible reporter and who isn't, who is trustworthy and who isn't, whose claims we ought to act on and whose we ought to question uh, or be skeptical of. Um, so we make these kinds of credibility judgments of one another, and we rely on a whole lot of evidence in doing this. Uh, we rely on one's demeanor, we rely on the way that one presents themselves, the way that one speaks. Uh, we rely on our background knowledge about the individual speaker. We rely on our background knowledge about uh, the point in question, about the content of their claims. Um, but there are a few things to note uh, within this credibility economy that um, are, are of, of central importance. One is that we tend to grant default entitlement to people uh, when they make claims. We we have uh, um, we have as our default to take people at their word. Uh, we take them to have good reason for the claims that they are making. We take them to be entitled to the claims that they are making. So when someone speaks, when someone says something to you, uh, your initial reaction, unless you have some reason to be skeptical, is to take them at their word. Uh, if someone tells you about the crappy commute that they had this morning, not that anyone is right now, um, but if someone tells you about their crappy commute, uh, you you uh, don't ask them for any evidence for this. You simply take them at their word. If someone tells you about uh, the wonderful dinner they had last night, you don't ask them for any evidence. Uh, you simply take them at their word. Uh, but there are cases where we don't simply take people at their words. Sometimes we have what we'll call a defeater for someone's claims. Defeaters come into types. Uh, there are both rebutting defeaters and undercutting defeaters. A rebutting defeater uh, is one uh, that uh, rebuts the content of the claim that is being made. So when you have a rebutting defeater for someone's claim, you know, or at least are fairly certain that the content of the claim that they are making is in fact false. 
you have some evidence that it's not the case that what they're saying is true. Uh, so you uh, can rebut the very content of the claim that they make and uh, on, those, on those grounds uh, judge their claim not to be credible. An undercutting defeater is different though. You can have an undercutting defeater for someone's claim even when you have no reason to think that the particular claim is false. You have no knowledge about the content of the claim whatsoever. Uh, an undercutting defeater is the kind of defeater you have if you have reason to think that the person who's making the claim is unreliable in this particular context. So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is, uh, is the example of someone who's colorblind. Uh, my mom, for example, is colorblind. Uh, and uh, I know that when she makes claims about what color something is, I ought to take those claims with a grain of salt. I have an undercutting defeater for her claim that this shirt is red. Um, that doesn't mean that I, I think she's trying to mislead me. It doesn't mean that I think that uh, she is, is trying to utter a falsehood. Uh, but it means that I am I, I come to this claim with a bit of skeptic a bit of skepticism uh, because of what I know about her reliability in making such judgments. Um, another example. Uh, I've got my friend Matt. Matt is one of my best friends. Uh, he was my roommate in college, has been one of my best friends since. Matt is one of the most trustworthy stand-up guys you could you could ever ask to know. He will always be there for you if you need help with something. If he gives you his word, he will follow through on it. Uh, he doesn't flake on you. He's always going to be there for you. He's that kind of a stand-up guy. But Matt likes to embellish a bit when he tells stories uh, about, you know, his night out on the town, about how he spent his weekend, about uh, the people he met when he was at the club th last night, uh, or about uh, the exciting adventures that he had when he had a little too much to drink last night. When Matt starts telling you these stories, yeah, you really shouldn't believe Matt. And you know this about Matt. Uh, you compartmentalize in this way. You've got an undercutting defeater for his claims about his nights out. Uh, this, uh, this is what I mean, this is what we mean by an undercutting defeater. In knowing Matt, uh, I know that he has a propensity to embellish on these stories, to exaggerate a bit, uh, and so I don't take these stories at face value. I take them with a grain of salt. Right? That's the idea of an undercutting defeater. Um, now, rebutting defeaters and undercutting defeaters uh, are not themselves instances of injustices. Uh, right? we, they, they are things that inform our credibility judgments. If we meet someone and we continually have rebutting defeaters for the claims that they're making, uh, we start to find ourselves with an undercutting defeater for many of their claims because well, we've found that they're not trustworthy. We found that they're not reliable uh, in reporting on the things that they've experienced or the things that they've seen. Um, and as such, uh, we become skeptical of the things that they tell us. Uh, and rightfully so, right? We should be skeptical. We, If we have reason to doubt what someone is saying, then we shouldn't trust what they're saying to us. That totally makes sense. Um, they are not themselves testimonial injustice. The problem of testimonial injustice arises when people are suffering from undue credibility deficits or benefiting from undue credibility excesses. An undue credibility deficit is a failure to attribute the credibility that a speaker is due. So in some cases, uh, we fail to uh, fail to take a person to be as reliable as we ought to take them. We fail to attribute to them the credibility that they are deserving of. Uh, in these sorts of cases happen quite often uh, in conjunction with other forms of discrimination and oppression. 
Uh, so uh, there are, for example, stereotypes of women being overly emotional and hysterical, or of trans women in particular being overly emotional and hysterical and and uh, um, too sensitive because they are on hormone replacement therapies. Uh, and to treat uh, a, a woman's claim about some experience that she had uh, or some injustice or harm that she has suffered as, uh, as uncredible because she is a woman would be to uh, treat her with an undue credibility deficit or encumber her with an undue credibility deficit uh, and to commit a testimonial injustice against her to not believe her simply because she is a woman. Uh, we also see this arise in uh, in conjunction with racial discrimination uh, and racial oppression. Um, if we uh, don't take the word, don't take someone's word uh, on their um, on, on the, their own experiences of racism. Uh, we don't listen to their accounts of uh, the uh, racist experiences they have suffered, or we don't listen to their accounts of their mistreatment at the hands of police, uh, and uh, do so not because we have some good reason for doubting their claims, but simply because they're black and black people are likely to play the race card, well, that is encumbering them with an undue credibility deficit. That's making an ingest credibility judgment uh, about them. And so they are suffering in that case from a kind of testimonial injustice. One thing that we should see here is the tight relationship between testimonial injustice and other forms of oppression. Testimonial injustice can uh, is supported by these other forms of oppression. It relies on stereotypes that are generated uh, in these in, in these other systemic forms of oppression, and it also serves to reinforce these systemic forms of impression of oppression because. Uh, if uh, a black person, say, suffers from testimonial injustice uh, when they try to report on the racist experiences that they have had, uh, or when they try to report on uh, the unjust treatment they've suffered at the hands of police, uh, then uh, the dominant group is not going to be accepting of their claims. They're going to judge them as uncredible and as a result uh, are going to not recognize the injustice that has occurred. They're not going to be able to see it for themselves because they're not in the proper position to be able to see it. They don't have the proper standpoint to be able to see it. But they're also not going to allow the claims uh, that would make this injustice evident to be heard. So testimonial injustice has this really tight, interlocking relationship with other forms of oppression. Um, undue credibility excesses are a kind of flip side of undue credibility deficits. Uh, these are attributions of credibility that the speaker is not due. Uh, we often treat people who are in positions of power uh, as more credible than they ought to be treated. Uh, men are often treated as more credible than they ought to be treated, uh, especially when uh, claims of sexual assault or of sexual harassment are made against them. Uh, so men often benefit from an undue credibility excess when they find themselves in a he said, she said sort of circumstance. Uh, and women suffer from, uh, historically have suffered from an undue credibility deficit. We can see actually the Me Too movement as a response to just this kind of undue credibility deficit and undue credibility excess. Uh, the Me Too movement is an attempt to uh, reset these uh, epistemic norms to uh, to challenge the credibility judgments that historically have been made and to try to uh, cause us to reflect on them, to believe the claims that women make 
uh, when the only evidence that's available is their testimony. Um, let's move on now to hermeneutical injustices. A hermeneutical injustice is slightly different from a testimonial injustice. That's why it has a different name. Um, hermeneutical injustices have to do with the unjust distribution of uh, knowledge and concepts within an epistemic community rather than the unjust distribution of credibility within an epistemic community. Uh, Miranda Fricker uh, understood hermeneutical injustices in terms of an unjust distribution of what she called hermeneutical resources. And hermeneutical resources, she said, are our shared tools of social interpretation. Hermeneutics is the practice of making meaning or understanding the experiences that we have in a shared way. We come to a shared understanding of these experiences by the use of certain concepts or tools uh, that we each understand uh, because we've had experiences of them, because we've learned to use them together. Uh, so if you say that you have a headache, I understand what you mean. If I say that my allergies are bothering me, you understand what I mean, because we have shared hermeneutical resources for making sense of these experiences. If we lack those shared hermeneutical resources, various problems can arise. Uh, you might not be able to understand something that I claim, something that has I have experienced when I try to explain it to you if we lack these resources. Uh, or you might have certain resources uh, that you don't allow me to have access to. Uh, you reject my access to those resources, and so I can't come to make sense of the experiences that I am having because I lack those resources. Each of those is a different kind of hermeneutical injustice. Uh, so Fricker defined hermeneutical injustice as the injustice of having some significant area of one's social experiences obscured from collective understanding owing to a structural identity prejudice in the collective hermeneutical resource. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, hermeneutical injustices are the result of hermeneutical marginalizations, and these marginalizations can take two forms. One form of hermeneutical marginalization occurs when, as I just said, someone is, or some group, because of their identity, is prevented from accessing certain hermeneutical resources, uh, certain resources that we need for making sense of the experiences that we are having. Um, so on a kind of micro level, you can ex imagine coming to work in a new office. Uh, and every office has its own norms, its own lingo, its own uh, acronyms that they use, uh, its own office speak. Uh, and uh, you need to have access to those hermeneutical resources in order to function in your role in that office, in order to make sense of the, uh, the instructions you're being given by others in order to communicate your needs to others, in order to understand why others are acting in the way they are toward you, or why your clients are acting in a particular way toward you, you need to have access to these sorts of resources. Now imagine coming into a new office and being excluded from the opportunity to access those resources. Uh, you hear people using this language, you hear people talking, but nobody will explain to you what it means. Uh, you don't get to go into the meetings where that language is used on a regular basis so that uh, you could come to uh, learn for yourself what it means. You don't get to go to uh, you know the, the private golf club on the weekend with the boss to learn uh, what it means and to become uh, uh, adept at using this language. Uh, no, you're excluded from it. Now, you would suffer as a result of that. You would lack an understanding of the very processes that are going on around you, and you wouldn't be able to communicate that lack to anyone. So that's a kind of marginalization that occurs when uh, 
you are prevented from, or an individual is prevented from accessing certain resources. Another kind of marginalization that occurs, another kind of hermeneutical marginalization that occurs, is when a non-dominant group develops its own resources for making sense of its shared experiences, or when the members of the group develop their own resources, their own concepts, their own uh, their own practices for making sense of their shared lived experiences, but they do so in a way that the dominant group refuses to recognize. So their practice uh, in which they make sense of their social circumstances is itself marginalized, is not recognized by the dominant group. This is what has been dubbed willful hermeneutical ignorance. Dr. Gail Polhouse uh, gave it this name, willful hermeneutical in ignorance. Uh, but it's a concept that Patricia Hill Collins uh, was, was working with, though she hadn't named it uh, in this way, uh, since at least the early 90s. Uh, she's been talking about black feminist epistemology, uh, the idea that, uh, that black women have practices of making sense of their own social circumstances, have uh, standards of evidence among themselves, have uh, standards of claim making among themselves uh, that are different than the dominant hermeneutical resources. Uh, they rely on narrative more than evidence in many cases. They rely on the reliability and cohesiveness of a narrative uh, more than the, uh, the say, quantitative evidence that can be given uh, in its support. Uh, and they uh, have developed concepts for understanding their own circumstances, uh, but these concepts have, uh, have not percolated up. Uh, and these practices have not percolated up to the dominant, uh, the, the dominant epistemic practitioners, the dominant social group to white men in society. Um, dominant groups have been willfully resistant to giving uptake or recognizing these non-dominant hermeneutical resources. And we can see why, because these non-dominant hermeneutical resources reveal the effects of the particular injustices that these non-dominant groups suffer. And so if, if the dominant group can prevent them from uh, expressing the injustices that they are suffering, uh, then the dominant group uh, doesn't need to address those injustices. They can continue to benefit from them. Uh, one prime example of this sort of willful hermeneutical ignorance that has, has thankfully been overcome uh, is the example of uh, of sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, sexual harassment in the workplace is not something new. It's something that has happened ever since there was a workplace, probably. Um, but uh, it wasn't until uh, the 1980s uh, that feminist scholars uh, started putting language to uh, the experiences of women in the workplace uh, that recognized those experiences as a harm that they were experiencing, as an injustice that they were suffering in terms that could be recognized by the legal system, that could be recognized by the courts. Uh, it wasn't until the term sexual harassment was coined by Catherine McKinnon and other feminist scholars uh, in the 80s uh, that uh, women could point to these shared experiences and say, hey, that creepy guy in accounting uh, that that uh, constantly tries to hit on me, or that uh, that boss that tries to grope me, uh, and uh, you know, I, I didn't give me a promotion last year because I pushed his hand away. Right? They used to be able to tell stories about those guys to one another and say, "Stay away from them. Those guys are creepy. Those guys are a problem." But they didn't have language to to talk about their shared experiences across different office environments. It was, know, it was a thing that happened to some women in some places here and there, not a widespread uh, phenomenon 
And once the language of sexual harassment became commonplace, we came, we started to understand just how widespread this phenomenon is. Again, the Me Too movement is a part of helping us understand just how widespread this horrible phenomenon is. Uh, and um, it, uh, uh, it's clear why uh, these uh, sort of the sort of storytelling practices that existed before then, the narrative practices that existed before uh, the the naming of sexual harassment were uh, remained non-dominant practices, uh, remain parts of the non-dominant practices, why this sort of willful hermeneutical ignorance was practiced, it was because it was useful in protecting the perpetrators of this harassment, it was useful in keeping the women who experienced it silent. Um, and that leads us into our next uh, next bit here. Uh, Christy Dotson, another more contemporary feminist scholar, uh, has named some aspects of uh, hermeneutical injustice. Uh, testimonial quieting and testimonial smothering, she has called them. Testimonial quieting is a little bit like testimonial injustice in that uh, in instances of testimonial quieting, uh, the individual's uh, claims are discredited or not accepted. Um, but unlike instances of testimonial injustice, in instances of quieting, it's as if the speaker didn't speak at all. Uh, no credibility judgment is even made. Uh, so as, um, as Rachel McKinnon put it, for the wrong, often racist or sexist reasons, the audience doesn't regard the speaker even as a possible source of knowledge. So it's not like uh, we we listen to you, but then judge you to be uncredible. It's rather like, uh, you know, because of who you are, because you are black, or because you are a woman, or because you are trans, or because you are, uh, are um, bi, or because uh, you are uh, an immigrant, we're simply not going to listen to you at all. Whatever comes out of your mouth, we're just going to ignore it. That's testimonial quieting. We just don't even hear you. Um, and it feeds into uh, a kind of hermeneutical injustice uh, because it supports willful hermeneutical ignorance. We don't even try to listen to your claims. We don't even take the time to make credibility judgments. Uh, we're never going to, uh, or the dominant practice is never going to incorporate the ideas that you are expressing. Um, she also named what she called testimonial smothering. Uh, in cases of testimonial smothering, the speaker herself withholds testimony. So rather than the hearer uh, being willfully ignorant or judging the speaker to lack credibility, the speaker herself simply withholds testimony. But this sort of self-censorship is a direct response to the recognition that an audience is unlikely to give adequate uptake to one's testimony. So the speaker isn't just silencing herself because she doesn't feel like speaking or because she doesn't think what she has to say is important. She's not excluding herself. Rather, she's smothering her testimony because she recognizes that it will receive a hostile uptake from her audience if it receives any kind of an uptake at all. Uh, so uh, it's uh, the kind of um, the kind of act that someone who say suffers a sexual assault uh, but is afraid to come forward, afraid to say anything about it because they're afraid they'll be shamed or their family will blame them. Uh, or uh, the person who uh, is accused of this assault is in a position of power and uh, will be able to exact retribution on them, uh, or uh, the person who is accused of this result is in a position of power or authority, uh, and others will come to their defense, uh, and so she just doesn't speak up. That's testimonial smothering. That's the idea uh, that 
um, that Christy Dotson is trying to develop here. Um, so we can see how these various ideas, testimonial injustice, hermeneutical injustice, willful hermeneutical ignorance, testimonial quieting, and testimonial smothering, all are interlocking uh, and uh, both uh, results of and supportive of uh, broader systems of oppression. Uh, they allow us to ignore, um, they allow us to marginalize the voices that would make us aware of these broader systems of oppression. The second piece we read from Rachel McKinnon uh, was a piece on uh, gaslighting, on epistemic gaslighting in particular. I'm not going to say much about this here, but I hope we'll be able to have some time to discuss it uh, when we meet this week. Gaslighting is the idea that a hearer uh, consistently doubts or expresses doubt about a speaker's testimony about harms or injustices she has, she's suffered. And the effect of these repeated instances is to cause the speaker to begin to doubt her own reliability or her own credibility. So gaslighting uh, has the effect of making one doubt oneself, of making one well, feel like you're losing your mind, uh, feel like um, your own judgments aren't trustworthy or reliable uh, because you're con consistently doubted. Doubts are consistently raised about the claims that you're making. McKinnon gives the example uh, of a trans person uh, being mispronounced. Uh, and if the trans person is mispronounced uh, repeatedly by someone who claims to be an ally uh, and then tries to tell others about this experience, and those others say, well, so-and-so couldn't have done that because he's an ally, he's on our side, or the ally themselves say, I never would have done that. Uh, if they hear this enough times, the trans person who's been mispronounced uh, experiences a, a second kind of harm here, uh, the harm of coming to doubt what they heard. Maybe they were wrong. Maybe I didn't Maybe, maybe I didn't hear that right. Maybe I heard something I wanted to hear instead of what they actually said. This is gaslighting. Uh, when you force a person to start doubting the reliability of their own sensory experiences. All right. Uh, I have no nice tidy way of wrapping this up. This was a smattering of different concepts that all uh, are outgrowths of uh, systems of oppression, but also reinforcements to systems of oppression. Uh, and I hope we can have some interesting discussion about them this week. Thanks.